Hi friends, welcome to my channel. I'm Gio, and this story is called Notice Me, Part 1. He barely knew I existed. Hutch, a sophomore, sat in the dining room table, laptop out, and surrounded by note cards, papers, and photocopies. He wore a faded red shirt with the sides and sleeves ripped off, and a pair of khaki shorts. The shirt was so torn he could have paraded around shirtless for all it covered. He had big pecs and big arms, and the shirt didn't cover his left nipple. A surfer from Hawaii, Hutch had been in the sun all his life and had the tan and sun-bleached hair to prove it. Hutch was easily the best-looking guy in the frat. Hutch was also the latest in a long line of crushes that no one knew about. He was the kind of man I wished I could talk to. His lips slightly puckered as he concentrated. I wanted to kiss those lips. My name is Jason, a freshman, one of the newest recruits for the frat. I'm 19 while most of the other freshmen were 18. I seemed like everybody else pushed myself to be crazy just like them, and they accepted me. But unlike them, I locked the real me away. Nobody knew I was gay. Not my family, not my friends, not anyone in the frat. Nobody knew me. It was safer that way. Growing up as the youngest of five boys meant a life of constantly trying to be as good as my brothers, Ether, Ammon, Elias, and Isaiah. I was always last, because I was the youngest, thereby the smallest, until my sister, Rebecca, was born when I was sixteen. Then I became the most forgotten, but I was still picked on. It wasn't as bad because Ether and Ammon had moved out, and Elias and Isaiah focused on girls. When I started ballet, Dad said, Does this mean you are never moving out? My brothers wouldn't stop hiding my ballet shoes. I almost had to live with friends. The teasing was so bad. I always had to check my toe shoes or ballet slippers for odd things and guard my tights day and night. When I hadn't, somebody had accidentally washed them with bleach. My dad and brothers wouldn't stop laughing. My family didn't know anything about me, because I didn't dare tell them. I had no choice but to stay in the closet. I have never dared have a boyfriend, never dared date it. Instead, I had to act as macho as my brothers and my dad. Being a virgin goes without saying. I grew up in Watson Hill, a small town in Utah. There was one time I did come out. Like a good little church boy, I confessed to my bishop. Biggest mistake of my life. The bishop shamed me for being a queer and told me how bad I was and how I would never inherit celestial glory. The only reason he didn't tell my parents was his vow of confidentiality. That confidentiality only extended downward to the regular church members. I learned later that he had spoken with my stake president to confer about my case. Did that mean that everybody who was a priesthood authority knew about me? I suspect so. My bishop scheduled monthly interviews with me so he could convince me of my sinfulness. The first interview stressed me out so bad I stayed away from him and haven't gone to any church since. Dad and Grandfather didn't like that. The fights I had with them were so loud the neighbors complained. You will attend all your meetings, and I expect you to fast at least once a month. I fast every Sunday. And the bishop told me you don't pay tithing, 
grandfather said. That's supposed to be confidential. Go to hell, I yelled and left. Every time I went home, it was the same way until I stopped going home and lived with my oldest brother, Ether, and his family. No, I don't dare trust anyone. The month after high school, I moved to Salt Lake City to get away from the nightmare that was Watson Hill. Last summer, I escaped Utah. Tonight, I would change my life. I would let down my guard and trust Hutch. I would tell him how I feel, which also meant for the first time ever, I would tell a friend I was gay. Tonight was the night of the living frat Halloween party, and I had created the sexiest costume so I could impress Hutch. Based on some comments he once said, he was bi. I wanted to advertise myself a little, make him notice me. I'd wear the black thong, my costume from when I played Ariel in the ballet version of Shakespeare's The Tempest. My family came to see me opening night, and my grandfather turned purple mad when he saw that that was the only thing I was wearing. Good men never wear things like that, and in public, once again, you shamed your family. Grandpa had yelled as he stormed out, yanking Grandma with him. Tonight, the thong would be covered by a skimpy leopard print loincloth and sandals I'd used when I danced in a music video for Pixie with One Red Shoe. I'm hoping Hutch would finally look at me. Maybe we'd dance, maybe we'd go for a late night walk. Maybe I could hold Hutch's hand. Would he let me give him a tiny kiss? Somewhere in that conversation, I'd tell him that I was gay, and I liked him. I rubbed my shoulder. Last weekend, I had gotten a Celtic tattoo, and though it had healed over, occasionally it itched. Jason, there's a box of decorations in the living room. Bring them out front, Solomon said. A senior, he's this year's frat president. I found the box and hauled it to the porch. A bunch of guys, Albrecht, Ben, Finn, and Solomon, were hanging ghosts and skeletons from the porch, or sticking spooky things in the lawn. Dane and Anders hopped into Dane's car and headed to the grocery store. Dane and Anders were a couple and shared a room. They weren't afraid to be who they were. Dane... Albrecht, Ben, Finn, and Hutch all joined at the same time I did, but they became immediate friends, and the frat loved them while I was the outsider. It was terrifying to trust anyone. I walked inside and took some of the extra spatulas and tongs to the barbecues. When I got back, Hutch still typed away in the living room. How's it going? I asked. He didn't say anything. Maybe he didn't hear me. Jason, bring the briquettes and the extra propane tanks back to the barbecues. They're in my car, Solomon said. I wrapped my knuckles on the wall a couple of times and went to the car. The guys were expecting a lot of people, and it took me ten minutes to haul everything back to the barbecues. On my last trip, Albrecht, a freshman from Germany, had some trouble with the stepladder. He was trying to hang ghosts, but the stepladder wouldn't open up. I took one side, Albrecht the other, and after a good pull, the ladder clicked and opened. Hutch still sat in the dining room, typing and reading on his laptop. I really wanted to talk to him. We're alone. Now is my chance. Remember, act casual. Hey, cutie. Why aren't you on the barbecues or hanging decorations like the rest of us? Lazy, I said. Did I really just call him cutie and lazy? I'm about to blow this, and the night hasn't even started. Bro, my ten-page torture session is due tomorrow. Professor Sampson docks serious percentage points for late work, like 50%, Hutch said. He didn't even look at me. 
I took hold of his laptop and shifted it so I could see. Solomon walked in behind me, carrying a box. What do you think of this total tombstone? Hutch said. I quickly read the screen. Hutch had overworked the life out of it. Besides being a dancer, I'm a writer. I've written many gay romance stories, but they stayed hidden away. That's another thing nobody knows about me. I tried to tell my dad once. He was cleaning his pistol when I told him, but dad sneered. How embarrassing. My son wants to be a ballet dancing English teacher. If your grandfather finds out, he'll forbid it. Maybe I should too. What do I tell Hutch? The truth? His paper is very overworked and has no life. Boring. For a surfer, you sure don't know how to have fun. Work on it after the party, Solomon said. I know. I'll be diplomatic. It's not you. There's no life in it, I said. Don't be a hater, Hutch said, and flipped the laptop around. He jumped into his paper as if I never existed. I went into the kitchen and placed a lot of soda in the fridge, right next to all the beer. I've never tried beer either. Besides being underage, I'm only 19. My parents refused to drink. Their religion didn't allow it, and grandfather shunned anyone who drank. Coffee, tea, and cola were a sin, too, at least according to grandfather. Once I left home and moved in with Ether, I learned to love some morning Joe. Ether and his wife brewed something delicious from the Caribbean and swore me to secrecy. They didn't want grandfather finding out. I don't fit in with my own family, and I don't fit in here. I stared at Hutch a moment. I wish I could be popular like him, look like him. Admit it, I want a new life. Hutch left his laptop. What if I made him notice me? My brothers had pulled this trick on me several times. It wouldn't take a second to shift his keyboard to symbols. Then I would be nearby when he got back and yelled for help. I'd help him immediately, saying he must have accidentally triggered the sequence. I'd fix it. He'd say thanks, then we could start talking. I could tell him I liked him. I made sure no one was looking, and typed a couple of things into his keyboard, and left it. I pretended to work with the stereo system, and waited. Hutch returned to his chair. He typed. Any second now, he'd call for help. Hutch frowned, typed again, and his jaw dropped. He's about to call for help. Here comes my chance. Albrecht, Hutch yelled. Albrecht, the genius from Germany? Hutch picked up his laptop and ran out of the room. Wait, I can fix it, I said, but Hutch didn't hear me. That didn't work. I leaned against the wall, folding my arms, and stared at his empty chair. A moment later, Hutch and Albrecht took the stairs up to the bedrooms. Jason, we need more lighter fluid. See if there's any in the kitchen, Herb said. Forcing myself to move, I went into the kitchen. Grin, another new guy, stood at the sink, washing dishes. His real name was Greenwich, but he preferred Grin, and he was good at magic and card tricks. Why don't you wave your hands and twirl your wand to get them all done at once, I teased. Grin smiled, his hands in the soapy water, and he said, I'm saving the magic to impress my boyfriend. I'll bet you need one of these later. Check your wallet. I pulled open my wallet. A black condom package labeled Magic was neatly sandwiched inside. I hadn't gone near him, and his hands had been in the sudsy water the entire time. How'd you do that? I asked. Magic, Grin said. Can you snap your fingers and magically fix my life? I said, trying to hide the bitterness inside. Grin grew serious, and it seemed like he could see the turmoil in my mind. You're not broken, and never have been. Obviously, he didn't know what my life was like. 
Grin wiped his hands dry and reached into his pocket. He pulled out a deck of oversized cards and set them on a dry part of the counter. Choose your fate, he said. Tarot cards. Grandfather would not approve. Cutting the deck, I flipped the cards over to reveal the death card. My soul chilled. What's it mean? Am I supposed to die tonight? I asked. The death card means transformation. Think summer to winter. But there is hope. When winter ends, spring begins. Your life is changing, but you choose how it changes, Grin said, and put the cards away. He went back to the sink and continued washing dishes. Later, when you need a friend, just yell for me. I had no idea what he meant. Talking with Grin was always weird. Hutch came back into the dining room and started typing again. He ran his fingers through his sun-bleached hair. The red shirt hung between both nipples now and showed off his ribs. The man was too sexy for my own good. How do I get Hutch to notice me? It had been a good plan, but he had gone to the wrong person for help. Somehow, I had to talk to him. Jason, living room needs a good vacuum. Do that, do the dining room, Solomon yelled. I grabbed the old upright from the closet and found a plug and started vacuuming. When a bunch of guys live together, it's amazing how no one vacuums and dishes are only done when something is needed. Hutch, take a break for 15 seconds and hold the door for us, Solomon yelled from the main door. Sure, bro. Hutch said, leaving his computer. What if I tried again, but with a different trick, a simpler one? I ran back to his computer and made a couple of adjustments and turned his display upside down. How many times had my brothers done this to me? Hutch would call for help immediately, and I'd be right there. Almost smiling from the anticipation, I hovered closer to the laptop. Now he'd say something, and I would fly to the rescue. Hutch sat down, took one look at his screen, and yelled, Albrecht! Before I could say anything, Hutch grabbed his laptop and ran outside. Not again. My heart beat faster than some of the rhythms I danced to. I had failed. A minute later, Albrecht and Hutch came back in. Maybe I can be more obvious. Albrecht, you are one rad bro, Hutch said, and he was smiling. Now's my chance. Computer problems? Can I help? Thanks, but Albrecht has it covered, Hutch said, taking the stairs two at a time. I took a breath and left the dining room. Why am I too afraid to talk to him? It's because nobody knows the inner me. Maybe I don't either. My phone rang. Mom? I'd been too busy these past weeks to check in with her. You'll have to speak fast. We're getting ready for the Halloween party, I said. Mom's voice trembled. I just wanted to warn you. Me and Eliza, you remember Ether's wife. She's such a sweet person. Anyway... We were getting ready for the Halloween party for Rebecca, our grandkids, and the neighbor children. Your grandparents came over, and your dad and grandfather were in the garage getting their guns ready for deer hunting season, while your grandmother stood around on her phone. She never even helped. The point is, your grandfather was angry and told me I was a wicked parent and demanded your phone number. Since you can't control your son, I will. I am the priesthood authority in this family, and it's about time Jason did as I say. I wouldn't give him your number, but your dad caved and gave it to him. It figures. Dad always did everything Grandfather wanted. How many times do I have to say no? I'm not going on a mission. I'm not part of his church, and I never want to be. I don't believe that way, and it's why I left Utah, I said. I wish I was as strong as you, Jason. I'm proud of you for finding your own path, and I love how independent you've become. We'll talk later because we both have parties to get ready for, Mom said. 
this was turning into one weird night. A few minutes later, Hutch and Albrecht came downstairs. Albrecht went outside. Hutch went back to the dining room. I resumed vacuuming the living room. Finished, then it was on to the dining room. Hutch hunched over his laptop, his fingers pecking at the keys. Almost done, he muttered. Maybe I should simply talk to him. No tricks. Maybe I could flirt a little to relax us both. I walked into the room. Hi, Hutch. Hutch didn't look up. Maybe he didn't hear me. I know what to do. What were those moves I had learned from that retro-modern dance production for Wrap Me in Your Love? I had to make sure Hutch was looking. To get his attention, I unplugged his laptop. Laptops have battery backup. The most it might do is dim the screen. But that might be enough for Hutch to look up and notice me. Don't mind me, I said. I stretched out his laptop cord so it resembled a cane and did the old Fred Astaire slide. Hutch's face clouded over and turned a little red. His eyebrows furrowed and his jaw tightened. Dude, that's due tomorrow. I swayed with the cord a bit, dancing, and smiled. Just a little bit of flirt. I needed the plug for the vacuum, I said. There's two plugs. You did that on purpose, Hutch yelled. Why was Hutch overreacting? Maybe he's kind of flirting back. I can flirt, too. Oops. Sorry, Hutch, I said in a very sultry way and swung the cord around as if it were a prop and finally pulled it tight. With my adrenaline pumping, I smiled and asked the question, Can I ask you something? No, plug it back in, Hutch yelled. Time to channel the inner porn star. I allowed a small, shy smile and dropped my voice to something low and sexy. I like it when you take charge. Make me. Hutch pulled the cord from my hand so hard it made my hands hurt. He wasn't playing around. He shoved the plug back into the outlet and pounded the on button on his laptop multiple times. He jumped up and switched the cord to another plug. The laptop shifted a little, and I saw the blank screen. Crap. The laptop never came on. I had trouble swallowing. My feet moved as if I wore lead weights. I had caused something serious. Hutch yanked the cord out of the wall and ran to the living room carrying his laptop. I followed, my armpits suddenly wet, my mouth suddenly dry. What had I done? I didn't mean for this to happen. He plugged the laptop into a different plug and jammed his thumb a dozen times on the on button. The laptop didn't respond. Albrecht, Hutch yelled. Solomon looked in. He'll be back later. I only wanted Hutch to notice me. I wanted to tell him how I felt. Now, that was impossible. Somehow, when I unplugged the laptop, it killed the laptop. Maybe there had been a power surge, or maybe he had a faulty battery. Maybe his motherboard quit, or something glitched in the software. My stomach soured. Hutch unplugged his laptop and blew a breath out. Now he noticed me. Hutch scowled, and he marched right up to me, his laptop held as if he wanted to hit me with it. Everybody in the room watched. I thought you were one of the bros, but you pulled a serious Noah, Hutch yelled. He stabbed my chest with his finger, pushing me back. I hope you're happy because I'd spent the last month on that paper. Now I'll miss a cool party because I'll meet and greet the dawn trying to salvage the mess. I don't even have a laptop to write on. Next time I see you, I'll go all aggro and the bros will be calling the cops on me for assault and battery to your pretty face. My stomach felt like I had swallowed acid. My face felt hot. I took a breath and inwardly whimpered. I had just ruined my life, Hutch's life, and turned today into the worst day ever. You can't miss the party, Solomon said. It's a frat obligation. Thanks to Jason, 
I've taken a header, Hutch said, scowling. Put me on cleanup duty tomorrow. I should say I'm sorry, or explain it wasn't what it looked like. That I only wanted Hutch to talk to me. That I needed an excuse to talk to him. I didn't mean to screw up what he'd been working on. I'd never seen Hutch so angry. So you're the guy that's been messing with the laptop, Solomon said. Everybody knew. Ben, Finn, Albrecht, Hugh, Howard, and many others stared at me. I ran back to the dining room so nobody would see me and turned the vacuum on to cover any noise that might whimper out of my mouth. The man I wanted to date hated me. I had destroyed his laptop and the paper he was working on. Why couldn't I have talked to him? Because I couldn't talk to anyone. I was composed again by the time I finished cleaning up the dining room when I heard Hutch say, Anyone got a laptop I can use? My grade is on the line. Maybe Hutch could use mine. I walked to the living room, pasting what I hoped was a friendly smile on my face. I would apologize. I had barely gotten in the room when Hutch turned and looked at me. It was the kind of stare that said, Watch your back. I'm coming for you. Hutch walked towards me and would have shoulder shoved me had I not dodged. He was upstairs before I could even think of something to say. I'd stay out of Hutch's way for at least a month. He's furious with you, Solomon said. When my brothers had pulled those tricks on me, I'd been mad. Why did I try them on Hutch? Why can't I talk to him, to anybody? I got out of everybody's way and went back to the barbecues. At least here, I was kind of alone. Flipping burgers and steaks, I lost myself in the barbecues. Until my phone rang. I flipped the burgers with one hand and answered with the other. Jason? I would like to speak with you about celestial matters, Grandfather said. As if this day couldn't get any worse. Not now, Grandfather. We're setting up for a party, I said. Your soul is at stake, so your party doesn't matter. I am the patriarch and priesthood authority of our family. I am a high priest of the order of Melchizedek, the highest order given to man. I am a member of the high council of our stake, and you will obey me, Grandfather said. No, Grandfather, I won't go on a mission, or serve in your church, or obey your every whim. I'm my own man, I said, my heart racing. The only reason you won't is because you have given into temptation and are living in sin. You will return to our family and get your life in order. You will no longer engage in your homosexual fantasies grandfather said, with a slight sneer when he said, homosexual. You know, how, I blurted out. Both your bishop and the stake president consulted me about the best way to handle your immorality years ago. Now you will return and become a man who can inherit celestial glory, a man who can be married in the holy temple to one of the daughters of Eve, a man who will serve his heavenly father for the next Two years, just like every other man in my family, Grandfather said. My stomach wanted to heave, more proof that talking to the bishop had been a mistake. Go to hell, you old goat, and don't call back, I said. Apologize for your disrespect, Grandfather said. Truth hurts, I yelled and hung up. My hands began to shake, and I forced myself to breathe. Who would understand my life? There was no one I could talk to. This night had turned into a disaster. My life was a disaster. What do I do now? Good thing Watson Hill was five hours away, so they can't visit me. An idea popped into my overstressed brain. What if Hutch came downstairs to join the party for a little while? I could be ready to meet him. Maybe that would give me a chance to explain and set something right. I have to get ready, I said, 
and handed the tongs and spatula to Howard. To get to my second-floor room, I had to pass Hutch's door. It was closed. I paused outside it. There was a light under the door. Should I knock? He was probably writing, so it was a bad idea to disturb him. Once behind the safety of my own door, I stripped and put on the sexy costume I had prepared for Hutch. Jungle wig, jungle claw necklace, sandals, and leopard skin loincloth, and the thong. For extra measure, I used a little bit of the cologne my oldest brother, Ether, had sent me for my last birthday. What if Hutch didn't come downstairs? I can't think like that. Once again, I walked past his door, listening for any sign of life. It was quiet. I joined the other frat guys downstairs and danced while trying not to think about Grandfather or about Hutch. My life was in nuclear meltdown mode. Every couple of minutes, I looked for Hutch. Anders and Dane were dressed like twin samurai, and Ben was dressed like a biker, and Grin was an Egyptian pharaoh. But no Hutch. Could I talk to Grin about how my life was falling apart? You need to apologize to Hutch, and soon, Solomon said. He's been working on that paper for a month. I know Professor Samson. That paper is the grade. No paper means Hutch has failed the class. A late paper might mean a D. Either way, it's your fault. Solomon moved away before I could answer. A hush went through the frat boys, and a couple glanced my way. I looked up. Hutch had arrived. He wore the same clothes as earlier and carried a plate of food. He looked at me with pure anger. How could I have screwed up so bad? A police siren sounded outside. Who called the cops? Finn yelled. A bead of sweat ran down my arm. What can I do? I can apologize. I pushed through the crowd to get to Hutch, but there were too many people. Do you think the cops are here because Hutch is going to beat up Jason? Howard said, and looked at me. I pulled the stupid wig off my head. Hutch glanced at me once, then disappeared upstairs. I had screwed up his life, his grade. He couldn't come to the party because he had to put the paper together. I had destroyed the man I had a crush on. The party didn't seem fun anymore. I fled upstairs as the police knocked on the door, let the others deal with it. I stopped outside Hutch's door, afraid to knock, afraid not to knock. The fear won. I went back to my room and changed into cut off sweats and fell on my bed. I wanted to talk to somebody about this, but nobody knew I was gay. Nobody knew how I felt for Hutch. Nobody knew me. My grandfather knew the part of me I hid away. That terrified me. I wouldn't go back to Watson Hill for years. My stomach hurt. I'd never felt so alone, so isolated in my life. I wanted to call home to speak to Mom or Dad, but then I'd have to tell them everything. Then my family would tease me and prank me for years. Calling home wasn't an option. My phone rang. Mom again. Happy Halloween. Grandfather was screaming and shouting in the background. My three-year-old sister was crying. Hi, Mom. Everything all right? I asked. Mom's voice was slightly hollow, as if she were on speaker. She spoke fast, and fury clipped her words. We were having the annual Halloween party with your brothers and their families. Everybody was here. Your grandfather called for quiet and said we needed to do an intervention about you, and then he outed you to everyone, and he's blaming me for you being gay, and he's saying it's my fault that you are defying him, that I am a poor parent and have failed him. Everybody knows I'm gay, I said. A dark pit opened in my heart, and I forced my voice to sound calm. Had my world just ended... I can't breathe. You could never hide that from me. I know you. 
I thought it best to let you come to me when you were ready to talk about it. I'm sorry, honey. I wish I could have done something tonight, but you know your grandfather, mother said. Her voice broke. Was she crying? Something clicked in the background. It sounded like a suitcase. Mom, what are you doing? I can't live here anymore. I'm taking your sister and leaving. I'm sick of your father always siding with your grandfather. I'm getting a divorce and canceling my church membership. I've had enough, Mom said. Keep your voice down. Everybody can hear you. Where do you think you're going? Dad said in the background. Mom started shouting. Let everyone hear what a horrible husband you are. You let your father humiliate me and didn't say anything. That's what, the hundredth time? You let that fanatic tell everybody Jason is gay, and he degraded your son in front of everybody at the party. Your son isn't even here to defend himself. What do you do? Do you act like the loving dad and defend your son? Or me? No, you back the monster who raised you. Either you grow a spine, or we're getting a divorce. They're my parents, Dad yelled. I'm your wife, and Jason is your son. Choose your family or your parents. You can't have both, Mom yelled. You're being unreasonable, and you must trust me on this. Jason will put away his unrighteousness and live his life according to holy principle. We must protect his celestial inheritance, because he is squandering it, and ensure our family will be in the celestial kingdom, another voice said. It was my grandfather's. Jason is fine. It's you who are sick, mother yelled. You're overreacting. Just agree with my father, and we'll bring Jason home in the morning, my father said. That man is controlling you, and I'm sick of it. You will kick that man out of my house, and he will never return, mom screamed. I will not defy my father, Dad yelled back. Mom, what's going on? I said. Is that Jason on the other end? He heard all of this? Another voice. Was that Ether? Yes, your brother heard all of it, Mom said. Jason, Grandfather said. I won't have a member of my family live a gay lifestyle. You will return to Watson Hill, or I and your father will go down to Vegas and bring you back. Are you going to let that monster do that? Jason is your son, Mom yelled. You're being paranoid. My father is head of this family and knows what's best, Dad said. No, he's not. My lawyer will be in contact. Goodbye, Mom yelled. Wait, you can't leave. We're eternally married, Dad said. Not after the divorce. You either choose your father or your family, Mom said. You're not making sense, Dad said. Your father's been gaslighting you, and you've done it to me for years. Goodbye, Mom said. Mom didn't say anything more, but from the noises on the phone, she gathered my sister and headed to the car. All the while, my father kept begging her to stay. After she'd gotten in her car, I asked, Mom, you're getting divorced because of me? A quick panic flooded my entire body. Honey, don't you ever think that. I love you. You were smart to leave when you did, and I wish I had left sooner. I'm doing this so your sister can have a normal life. I'll call you later and we can talk, Mom said, and hung up. My life kept getting worse.